the money started to come in from different sources. <coughs> Our aunt gave us shekels, 20 pounds worth of shekels. We got a check from Indonesia for 200 pounds sterling, which was 231 pounds and a penny. That's something else. What else? We got 35 pounds worth of dollars. Oh, oh yeah, 35 pounds worth of dollars. Money pushed in the letter box anonymously, 100 pounds. And a check from my mother for 100 pounds. And the whole lot was converted. We had 500 pounds and one penny. <laughs> Lord, thanks me exceedingly abundantly more than we asked the thing. So, anyway, up we went to the Holy Land and we had a marvelous time there. And I met a priest out there who was a Holy Ghost Father. There were only 14 of us on this pilgrimage. And when we got there, we were staying in the Mount Scopus Hotel, looking across Kidman Valley. And he said to me when we got out, he said, I think we'll go down into the old city. He told us we'd walk down. It was about 10 o'clock. So we went into the old city and coming out through the Damascus Gate, he said, this is where St. Paul came out. I said, you know, I had the same experience that St. Paul had. He said, I was taken up into heaven and he wasn't. And he said, tell me about this. So I started to tell him, and by the time we got home to the hotel, which was an Arab hotel, we were standing in the foyer, and he said to me, I'm not going one more step until you pray with me for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we did, and that's what happened. He was baptized in the Spirit. <clears throat> but subsequently we came home, and they were asking me at the prayer meeting, I was leading the meeting, um, well, what was the message you got from the Holy Land? And I said, well, the message I get is that there are hundreds of thousands of Jews in the Holy Land walking in the footprints of Jesus, and they don't know him. They've never met him. I met him in the front room at home. You don't have to go to the Holy Land to meet Jesus. And afterwards, this young fellow of 19, his name was Peter Hickey, he came to me and he said, Joe, the Lord has given me a word for you. And I said, what's that, Peter? He said, you're going to have a son, and you must call his name Benjamin. I said, come off it, Peter. We had six of them already. Thank you very much now. That's it. He said, that's the word. So I went home and I told Pat, and she thought it was the funniest thing she ever had. <laughs> Until about six weeks later. <laughs> she discovered she's expecting another baby, and she said to me, if I had known there's something special, you could have gone to Jerusalem on your own. <laughs> anyway, and be, ever before he was born, they were calling him Benjamin. The bump was Benjamin, you know. And before she had to go into a hospital, it was a cesarean section. With no money again, and she said to me, we can't afford this baby. And I said, well, that never stopped us with the other six. I'm sure the Lord will provide. And I said, turn over now, go sleep. And then I said, Lord, you know you're going to provide, and I know you're going to provide, but we're not having the baby. Pat's the one who's having the baby. She needs to know you're going to provide too. The following morning, we were leaving home at half past ten to get into the hospital by eleven. A letter arrived in the letterbox. I opened it, and there was a card with the love of the Lord and welcoming the baby in advance. Bank was trapped for 500 euro pounds. I don't know. No idea who sent it. So that's how the Lord provided me. But anyway, <coughs> Benjamin was born, great excitement. But the night before she said to me, you'll be very disappointed if it's a girl. And I said, well, I won't. Peter Rikki will have egg all over his face. <laughs> <laughs> then when he was born, people said, her aunts were saying, God, you can't call him a name like that. And no decent Irish Catholic was ever called a, a Jewish name like Benjamin. Call him Paddy, back for his grandfather. And said, his name is Benjamin. <coughs> About that. But um, some time afterwards, Pat's father died. His name was Paddy. And she went down, and he used to keep all his stuff locked in a lovely little box with inlaid mother of pearl. You know. and he always kept the key in his waistcoat, and they thought there might be a few barber bonds or something in there. There weren't any bonds. But there were lots of certificates death certificates, birth, marriage certificates. And they came across a marriage certificate dated 1859. Our Benjamin's great great grandfather baptized in the established, established Church of England in Tidmarsh in Berkshire. Mm -hmm. His name was Benjamin Clear. Mm -hmm. So Benjamin was named before he was born, and he's very special. But when he was three, I remember uh, Father Pat Kenny came to the house. He'd, he'd had surgery and he wasn't too well. And we prayed for him and we seemed to get all right. 
But a month afterwards, he came back with his sister and his niece. And Pat was in hospital with a prolapse operation. And anyway, I was praying with the niece in the front room. His sister was sitting on the stairs, and he was inside with the twins. It was the 10th, the 12th, 20th. They, they were writing Valentine cards, you know, the twins. They were 12 at the time. And, and uh, uh, Benjamin came out, he was three, and he looked at this woman sitting on the steps, and he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm waiting for your daddy. But he said, I'm sorry, he's a bit busy at the moment. Do you mind if I pray with you instead? <laughs> so he put his hand on her head and said, Bless us, our Lord, and these thy gifts. <laughs> then he said, I'm sorry, I don't have any oil at the moment, but as soon as daddy comes out, he'll give you a blessed the oil as well. <laughs> then we were told that this prolapse thing would be no problem. It would be a half an hour job. And we knew the theater's sister there, Dor Dorian. And she said, I'll ring you before we go in, and then I'll ring you afterwards. So she rang at a quarter to 11. We're going into theater now. And Benjamin and myself went into the front room and we knelt down and we started to pray. Quarter past eleven, half eleven, a quarter to twelve, twelve o'clock, quarter past twelve, an hour and a half later, the phone rang. It was Dorian. I said, what's the story, Dorian? She said, well, the operation is over. I said, are you coming from the theatre? And she said, no, I'm coming from the oratory. My heart sank. And I said, what's the story? She said, uh, she's not responding. They can't get rid of the anesthetic. They have five doctors with her at the moment, and it's not looking good. Now, Benjamin couldn't hear this. He was standing beside me. He grabbed me, my trousers and leg, and he pulled them, my trousers and said, Dad, I think we need to pray another little bit for Mammy. We went in and we prayed for another five minutes, and the phone rang, and Pat was out of the anesthetic. One of the most babes. That was us. But then, after that, Pat had suffered for 20 years from kidney problems. There was a stone in the kidney which the doctors ignored over eight pregnancies because we had a miscarriage as well. And they just ignored her and they slapped her in the face and said, everyone gets pain when they're having babies. And she was in a desperate state. And she collapsed and brought her into hospital. And they were very concerned because they said, look, she almost didn't come through the anesthetic the last time. It's a danger she might, might not come through this time. We'll have to remove the kidney. It wasn't cancerous, but they'd have to remove it. They tried to remove the kill it with this sonic thing, but it, all they did was burn her back. It was. Anyway, she was in. I <coughs> brought her in on the Friday, and I decided to pray and fast until after the operation was over on the Tuesday. So I fasted for four days, and I prayed. And I went in on Tuesday, and it was lunchtime. And she wasn't in the ward. She was still around the theater. I was coming out and I met this lady who was one of the cleaning ladies and she had a mop in her bucket and she said, and you were the man who prays. And I said, well, I'm praying fairly devoutly at the moment. She said, what's the problem? And I told her. Oh, she said, it's my lunch hour. We'll go down to the oratory and we'll pray. So we went on and we prayed for an hour. Then I came back and Pat was being wheeled in and she was conscious and she said they had to remove the kidney. And I said, well, praise God. You can live quite quite well on one kidney. And there was great rejoicing. But the next day her temperature shot up to 105. It stayed there for four weeks. And nothing the doctors could do would bring it down. They were shaking their heads. Little Benjamin was five and he was saying, When is mommy coming home? I had to take one of the girls out of school to look after the house. She was sixteen at this stage. Things were very bad. <clears throat> and all the time. This is morning, noon, and night. There was a voice in my head, pounding into my head, I'm going to take your wife, I'm going to take Patricia, I'm going to take your wife. I didn't know whether it was my imagination, or whether it was God, or whether it was Satan. But after a month, with the doctors shaking their heads, I decided I was going to pray and fast. This is again on a Friday, no matter how long it took, until Pat got better. And then this voice changed into a sneer. So if you'd stop this nonsense of praying with people, you wouldn't have this problem. Then I knew where the voice was coming from, straight from hell. And I said, Jesus, no matter what happens here with my dying breath, I'm going on. I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing. That was the end of the voice. But then, at that very moment, there was a conference of doctors at St. Vincent's Hospital. They called in a Mr. Hegarty, who was a consultant. He said, the problem here is that this woman has a serious infection. 
and the antibiotics you're giving her are only strong enough to mask it. They're not killing it. And we can't give her any stronger ones because she's only one kidney. So we'll have to take her off all medication. We'll have to operate to remove the infection. And if she comes through that, she has a good chance of survival. They took her off all medication. And from that instant, her blood pressure went to normal, her temperature was normal, her pulse was normal. I fasted for four days, went in after four days, brought that home, and she has not a kidney problem since. <coughs> so you see, sometimes we go through it. And she had this, I don't mean to embarrass you, Pat, but you're embarrassing me enough. <laughs> <laughs> and she had to have this quadruple bypass. They had to bring her up from Trevi by ambulance. And things were pretty bad. Um, I thought it was a triple bypass first, and they said it would have to be cut open. And she was in the hospital, and at half past ten in the morning, or half past eleven, they brought her down to the theatre, and we said a prayer before she left. <coughs> and we waited, and waited, and waited, and at half past four, my son rang to see how she was. She's still in the theatre. At half past seven, this is eight hours later, the phone rang, it was the surgeon. Well, he said, the, oper the operation is over, but... Um, we had a slight hitch, her heart stopped for four minutes during the operation. We are concerned about her head, lack of oxygen to the brain and so on. He said, we'll know better tomorrow. So anyway, I went and I did an odd night vigil in the church because we had perpetual adoration there and I prayed and fasted for a couple of days. And uh, then the next day she kind of came through all right. But I've been praying all the time, Lord, I want nothing less than a new lease of life with that. She's been thrown off. She needs a new lease of life. We were waiting for four years for our house to be completed. The pressures were something terrible, you know, and that could have been the cause. I said, Lord, I'm asking you for a new lease of life. But this does not look very, like a very new lease of life to me when our heart stops for four minutes. What's the story here? I had an audible voice. Yes. The first lease expired when our heart stopped. The second new lease of life started when our heart started again. That's nearly six months ago now, she's still going strong. So praise be to God. When we're up against it, prayer and fasting are very essential. I'd like to stress that sometimes prayer is not enough. When you're dealing with satanic powers, as I have been doing, as, as I was doing then, then we need all the help we can get. We need prayer and fasting. And when we do that, the Lord multiplies it and, and increases it. This is why I've been doing this now for 33 years. I've been fasting two days a week without any food of any kind. And as you can see, <laughs> I'm not losing any weight. <laughs> you see, it's, it's in Isaiah 58 verse 10, that true fasting puts fat on your bones. This must be my problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, I would say to you, it's, it's necessary for you to hang in when times like that. Praise God in every situation. Continue to believe and refuse to doubt. Because the doubt disqualifies us. These are some sicknesses and some of the things that I've seen happen. And I think I should tell you about my brother-in-law, who, Aunt Kavanagh. He was a principal teacher in Cahawk and Lish in Limerick. He was married to my sister. They had eight children. Aunt had two brothers and Christian brothers. He had a brother, a priest, two sisters, nuns. There were ten of them. But five of his brothers, or four of them, dropped out with dead with heart attacks. When they were in their fifties, Nat decided not to take any chances, and he took early retirement when he was fifty-eight. He promptly got four massive heart attacks. They rushed him into a hospital when he got the fifth one. His heart stopped, his kidney stopped functioning. The doctors got his heart going again, and they said to my sister Peg, Art is going to be dead by twelve o'clock tomorrow. So she rang the Monsignor who went and gave him the blessing of the sick and said, Peg, is the will of God, Art is going to heaven. She rang me at 11 o'clock at night to tell me the story. I said, Peg, will I come down? And she said, don't waste your time. So I prayed during the night and I went down by train the next day. Got into what was then Barrington's hospital at about 11 o'clock. An hour to deadline, if you'll excuse the pun. And Art was in intensive care in an oxygen tent, and he was rattling, and he was dying. And I said to him, Art, I believe Christ is going to heal you. He'll give you a new heart. Here's all the spare heart. And he looked at me, 
with as much amazement as a dying man could muster.